All right, let's get started. I think we have the critical mass here. So today, today we're gonna to talk about pipeline microprocessor. Uh, this is a very important lecture. Actually, pipelining is one of the essential techniques for improving the performance of digital hardware, including microprocessor. Uh, hopefully you guys will find this technique cool and uh, useful and interesting. Okay. Uh, as usual, a couple of announcements first. Um, first, more about Perlim 2 which is going to happen next Tuesday on April 20th right, at 1 p.m. This time uh, you'll get 80 minutes. Uh, we are going to post a uh, more detailed exam protocol on Piazza before uh, hopefully over weekend. Again, uh, I think we expect you guys to arrive at least five minutes earlier in the exam room. Okay, uh, like I mentioned last time, uh, we're going to cover lectures 8 through 16. Right. The topics include FSM, right, finance imaging, time analysis, binary arithmetic, man memory, and single cycle processor. Okay. Um, we will also allow you to look at the book and also look at the notes. In case you haven't noticed, right, Lisa has already made a long announcement on Piazza. There is a sample exam on CMS. Uh, I think that one is slightly, it was slightly longer, that one, was a 90 minute exam. Okay, just uh, uh, want you to make sure that you guys are aware of this. Uh, our exam will have probably one fewer question. And also uh, I'm gonna move the instructor office hour this week from Thursday to Sunday, uh, just in case you guys have some last minute question uh, for the lecture materials and also for prelim, right? Um, uh, one more thing. So we actually posted this, uh, in case you haven't noticed, there's actually a, a new notes on the course website. You can just click this link. This notes about time analysis. Uh, as I mentioned before, I already stressed before, time analysis is a very important topic. Hope you guys know what I mean by important before Prelim 2 as well. In case you're still confused about some of the concepts, you know, like how to meet the set of time, the whole time, and uh, where does this uh, cost skew comes into play. Take a look at this notes. Uh, this might be useful. Right? It's over here. So you can find it on the course website. Um, this is uh, listed um, over here um, in lecture 11. You can also just uh, click this link. Okay. And uh, also, Nikita just made an announcement right, about Lab 3. Uh, since we don't really have a homework due this week, so we decided to extend the deadline all the way to, to Friday. And you guys can do the checkout until Monday. Um, but still, so hopefully you guys can finish as soon as possible. Okay, so you have more time to prepare for the brief. Okay. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of the things that we covered last time, right? Uh, last week, we talked about this, like, uh, a programmable single cycle microprocessor. If you try to recall, right, what we did. So we actually started out from uh, this uh, ALU, right? And then we gradually add useful pieces to this, uh, is how we added register file, we added data RAM, we added the uh, instruction RAM, the, the program counter PC and the decoder. Okay? And also we added the support from branch. Right? This is for your branch instruction or branch select. Um, if you look at what we did, it's actually quite remarkable. Right? When these different pieces come together, we have a functional single cycle processor. Now where all we need to do is, uh, we can actually run any kind of program, right? All we need to do is, uh, we just have to load the, the right sequence of instruction over here, right? So we put it in the instruction RAM, and then we just have to set the PC, right? The program counter to the right address. And then we just let it run. Uh, and we will be able to, right? So the, the decoder will decode instruction into this set of a control word, right? So this is an important notion that we introduced. Basically, a set of a control signals and we will expect this data pass, right? We have something called data pass, the ALU, right? You know, all of this uh, sorry element to do the right thing at uh, the right moment, right? Um, and hopefully you guys find it quite remarkable, right? You know, this is basically the building blocks that we have learned. And this is something that's totally programmable. We can load a different program. Again, you know, the, the PC will just do the update, right? According to the instruction. We either do the increment or we do the branching. Right? It's going to happen automatically and it's going to 
be correct. Okay, so there's a question uh, about what the single cycle mean. Um, we're gonna talk about this right today. Uh, we're gonna make a contrast between the single cycle processor and the pipeline processor. Okay, this is a very good question. But over here, the assumption is that you know, we uh, do all the compute, right? See here, the assumption here, we load things from the RF, right? And then we go through ALU, this so-called execution stage, and we write it back, okay? Or including the parsing of instruction as well, right? All of this is done in a single clock cycle. That's the assumption. Okay, so that's why we call it a single cycle processor. Okay, and uh, you guys may, might have noticed right, over here uh, when I increment the, the PC here. Uh, this is a tweak, slight tweak, right? This is different from what we showed last time. There we have plus one. Instead over here, I'm showing plus two. The main reason here is that in our 2300 microprocessor and also in our 2300 memory system, we assume that uh, you know, this uh, memory, right, holds, instruction memory holds two byte instruction. Right? So this is basically our instruction coding. We have 16 bits for each instruction. And also our memory system is byte addressable, right? Mean that each memory address points to a byte, not a two byte work. Each byte is addressable. That's where uh, we are doing plus two, right? Because the instruction, each instruction basically takes two bytes, right, in the memory. That's where uh, I'm making a slight tweak over here. So instead of doing plus one now, uh, this is actually the right way to increment on PC for our system. You do plus two. Okay. And also last time I briefly talked about some of the branch instructions. Uh, in our uh, 2300 instruction set, right? So we have something called BEQ, uh, which basically compare RS and RT, right, to registers, and then jump to a target. We also have something called BNE, right, branch, BEQ basically means branch equal, right, if these two are equal. Uh, NE means a branch not equal, if it's not equal, we take the branch. BGEZ means uh, branch greater than or equal to. So basically look at this register RS, if this is uh, greater than or equal to zero, uh, we take the branch, and this is opposite, right? If it's less than zero. We, if it is less than zero, take the branch. Okay. Um, but last time I did not actually talk about some of the detailed semantics of this branch instruction. This is how the assembly code. Assembly basically means the, the low level machine language. Right? Uh, if you look at uh, the this uh, the this uh, right, the mainstream uh, programming flow, right? We usually start with high level programming language. And it could be C or C++ or Java or Python. Those will be actually compiled to this assembly code. Okay. I'm actually showing the assembly code. And eventually this assembly code will be uh, translated into the binary, instruction binary. If you look at the semantics of this assembly code, uh, you guys probably noticed something interesting, right? We are taking a branch. Obviously, you know, we want to update the PC, right? This is also, you will come back here. Uh, this is where we have this uh, second adder, right? This adder is doing a PC plus some offset over here. Okay. If you look at the detailed semantics, what we are doing is we actually do the sign extension, right? Not surprising because uh, immediate field is short, usually in those. But we actually append a zero here. Um, this is this, this comma means we can concatenate this uh, immediate value with another zero. We basically append a zero on the LSB side. Why are we doing this? Again, so the memory, right? We have a byte addressable memory system. Each memory address point to a byte location. This is our assumption. And each instructions are two bytes wide. Okay, meaning that these instructions are located in this even address or locations, right? Like a zero, zero address two, four, six, eight, and such. With that in mind, okay. We want to up, so by default, right? We want to update the PC. We want to increment it by two. This is something that I, that I just discussed. But when we are taking a branch, instead of doing this, okay, so this is what I showed. Also, you know, this is what the, right, we discussed last time. Um, instead of doing this, we don't do plus one anymore, right? We do plus two. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. Uh, but why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we appending another LSB to the 
rather than the zero to the LSB. Right, this is because we don't want to do this, right? So, you know, if the offset, if you know, we want to jump to instruction three instructions away, in the last lecture, right, we do PC plus three, right? Three is the offset. But what does this mean? Three instruction away means it's actually six bytes away. Right? So really when we calculate the actual memory address, we don't want to do PC plus three, instead we want to do PC plus six. If you look at the binary encoding, three is zero, one, one, right? six is zero, one, one, zero. So this is where we append another zero. Does it make sense? Okay, any questions? All right, so if this is clear, uh, let's look at the, the entire instruction set, right? So these are the set of the branch instructions. Okay, again, you guys are gonna practice, right? You guys are actually gonna implement most of this in the, the final lab, lab four. These are 2300 instruction set, and this is encoding. All the instructions are 16 bit wide, right? Last time we talked about something called R type, right? So we have R type instruction and I type instruction. For R type, we have you know addition, arithmetic, shift, and logic operation. Also, uh, we have something called NOP, NOP or no op. Okay. Usually we just call it no op. This means a dummy operation. This means a no operation. Uh, it it basically does nothing. Although this seems uh, useless, right? It's going to be clear uh, in the end of this lecture where we actually use it in some cases. And also there's something called hot when we stop the machine, when we stop the CPU. Uh, in our 2000 instruction set, we also classify this too as part of the R type instruction. For I type, um, we have you know, LB, right? Low byte. Again, our memory is byte addressable. That's where we have low byte, low the single byte. And we also have, uh, I also talk about load word, right, last time. Although it's not on this list, right? And we have other some uh, additional uh, immediate type instruction like NI, ORI, and branches. So these are complete set. Okay, so Mitchell is asking, is this a no op the same as pass? To some extent, uh, yes, we can, uh, you know, we can actually use the pass, right? It's a pass semantic in ALU to implement part of no op. Very good question. Okay, so this is our 2300 instruction set, right? Uh, actually, this instruction set is a, a very important concept. Uh, in general, okay, uh, this, uh, when we describe an instruction set, we are not just interested in describing the, this is just encoding, right? This is instruction format, right? We have this 16-bit instruction format and we decode it, right? So we divide it into a separate, a few separate fields, right? Like opcode, and you know uh, some of the additional RSRT, and this will be decoded right into the into you know some of this uh, uh, control words. But uh, what we are really interested in, in many cases is not just the instruction formats, right? Of course, we need to define what does each instruction mean, and what is the the memory system, right? How do we address it, and how the data are stored, right? So you know, is it byte addressable or not? and things like that. Later on in this lecture, we also talk about something called delay stop. And all this information combined formed this notion called ISA or ISA, instruction set architecture. This is a very, very important abstraction. Okay? ISA, instruction set architecture. Uh, this basically defines the contract between, this is really a contract between the hardware and the system software. By system software, I'm talking about compilers and operating systems. Okay, so basically, when we implement the compiler, uh, like I just described, right, you know, in uh, the, the current program flow, we compile a high level program right into this assembly or you know, binary code. The compiler does not need to know all of these control words, right, whether there are uh, like six muxes or 16 muxes or 600 muxes. We don't care. The compiler does not care. All the compiler cares about is, is uh, the semantics of the instructions and the instruction encoding. That's it. That's really up to the hardware developer, right, to implement this sort of microarchitecture, to implement uh, the the underlying hardware 
for the specific ISA. Okay. Um, and there are actually many examples. There are many interesting, um, I think you guys probably have heard of quite a few of this, but there are many interesting ISAs. The mainstream ones, uh, x86, hopefully you guys know, right? So which vendor is offering x86? Very good, okay, Intel, right? Who else? x86, anyone knows? There's another major CPU vendor. Very good, AMD, right? AMD Intel, they offer x86. So this is their ISA, instruction set architecture. In the embedded world, in the mobile world, ARM is more uh, popular. If you look at uh, the latest, actually the latest uh, Apple laptop, right? Uh, this is actually causing some trouble for our course. This M1 chip is ARM based. Used to be case the, the, uh, the Apple laptop, laptop were using, the chips were using x86. That's why you know this uh, quarter software does not run on this uh, new laptop. And in our textbook, we have uh, I think the textbook is discussing MIPS. This is a, a very uh, classic so called the risk architecture uh, instruction set. I'm going to talk about it later on. Uh, risk versus six in one of the lecture a little bit. And uh, IBM has power. Uh, the Sun microsystem used to have Spark. And this is also getting very popular. It's called RIS-5. RIS-5 is an open source ISA. Okay? Uh, all these are proprietary ISA, closed source. You have to pay licenses to implement uh, a CPU using this ISA. Okay? Um, there's a good question from, let me see. Okay, already there's some good discussion right, about this ISA. Um, right, so why, why do we have this many ISAs? Uh, later on, it's going to be clear. It's all about trade-offs. We already mentioned trade-off in many uh, in many lectures. For designing computer system, there's no optimal architecture. Right? There's no optimal design choice. It's really about trade-off. Right? Whether we want to get higher frequency or want to get right, lower power or lower cost and such. But actually, different ISA offer offer different trade-off. Of course, you no. Know, there's also some legacy issue. Right? You know, uh, some of these ISAs are proprietary. Okay. Um, that's where you know some of the the new ISAs are showing up, right? which is open source. Okay, so uh, one more time, right? I say it's an important concept. It's uh, the contract. It's really the contract. It defines a contract between the hardware and software. But in our class, right, we're going to focus on the twenty three hundred ISA, which is uh, actually a subset of the the MIPS ISA. It's very similar to a MIPS which is uh, something that you guys are reading from the textbook. Okay, so coming back to this, uh, this diagram, right? You know, we have this uh, single cycle microprocessor. Uh, so far, we have been mainly focusing on the, the functionality right, of this uh, microprocessor. We've been talking about how to do the, the compute, right? how to store and load from the memory and how to decode right, the instruction. But we haven't really focused on much, right? discussed much about the performance. How do we decide the performance for a single cycle processor? What metric is the, the key? Anyone knows? This is related to the timing analysis lecture. For a single cycle processor, what is the, the key metric that defines how fast this thing runs? Very good, Stephen, clock, right? The clock frequency. Uh, if you look at, um, basically we wanna analyze, right? The, the longest pass, right? The critical pass. So look at this a single cycle processor. Now we have a few, we can define a few stages, right? Uh, you know, first we need to fetch, right? We need to read the instruction, right? We call something, we call this stage as something, uh, called, this is something called instruction fetch. We fetch from the instruction RAM and we go through the, the decoder. This stage is called instruction decode. And then we fetch, right? We read from the RF, the register file, then go through the, this ALU. This ALU stage is called execution stage. Then we may or may not go to the main memory. This is the memory stage. Eventually we write it back, right? So there's this uh, a backward pass. Uh, this is something called write back, okay? So we actually uh, can, if we know the delay, right? So we can actually analyze the longest pass, the critical pass to de determine the, the call frequency. Just wanna repeat what I just mentioned. Now we can divide this uh, single cycle 
uh, processing into a few stages. First is called instruction fetch, IF. Second one is instruction decode. This is where we decode instruction and read the register file. Then we pass the operands to this so-called execute or EX stage. This is where we do the ALU operation. And we perform memory operation, we call it MEM. Then we do write back, write back uh, is called WB. This is where we write the result back to the original. file. All right, so here, uh, like we just uh, agreed on, right? Uh, we need to determine the call period. This is the uh, really the key metric, right? For defining the, the performance for a single cycle microprocessor. Assuming that each one of this step, okay, each one of this stage, uh, it takes just one nanosecond. I want to make it absolutely clear this is actually a false assumption. Okay, we're going to talk about this later on. But for now, let's just take this false assumption. Each step takes one nanosecond. Okay, this is sort of a uniform delay distribution. So in this case, right, the, the clock period is five nanosecond. Okay. Then really the question is how can we do better? Right? Is there any way that we can run the things in parallel? Maybe not, right? Because indeed, uh, if you look at this uh, different steps, right? Uh, like IF feeds data right to ID, and EX also depends on ID. So we have to run these things sequentially. It's actually not that clear how can we further improve the performance, right? It's actually not that obvious. So this is where pipelining comes into play. Okay, so before I talk about how we actually pipeline a microprocessor, I really want to give you guys some intuition. Okay? Uh, I'm pretty sure that many of you have already heard about the, the concept of pipeline right? uh, in other occasions. It's actually used in some of the day-to-day tasks, right? Uh, yes, you can just mentioned the uh, right, uh, interesting case, right? Uh, let me try to give you guys some analogy. Uh, actually, there are some uh, very classic analogy for pipelining. For example, um, some of the textbooks is using this, uh, you know, the, this uh, laundry, right? As uh, the laundry task as an uh, analogy for pipelining, you have to prepare the laundry and then you do the, right? You have to do the basic wash and then you, you dry, right? It's sort of like three step or four step and then you clap, right? So four step approach. But um, I'm not sure whether you guys uh, is a big fan of doing laundry, right? So we'll not use this analogy. And another analogy is this uh, car wash process. Okay, again, it probably does not apply to Ithaca, right? Because, you know, at least for most of you, you guys do not need a car to come to the campus. Yeah, uh, definitely not uh, in the COVID terms, right? And also, uh, even if you, you do drive, you do own a car, this is Ithaca, right? You know, it actually rains a lot. Okay, you know, we get this uh, uh, car wash, right? So. Uh, pretty often, right? Uh, offered by nature. Okay, this may not be a, a great analogy uh, for us either. So let let me talk about something that uh, I hope most of you are careful. Okay, let's talk about college education. Okay, let me use that one as an analogy for pipelining. Uh, let me try to simplify the settings a bit. Okay, first assumption is you know, let's say you guys. Uh, come to Cornell and you guys want to pursue a major, a computer engineering major. Uh, the requirement of this major is, you know, you guys need to finish four courses each per year. First is an ENGRI 1210, right, this is year one. Okay, uh, second one, 2300, right, year two. Uh, you guys probably know that uh, the next one is called 3140 okay, embedded system, okay, year three, and then 4750. This is uh, okay for year four. Come on, can I write on here? Okay, for them, 4750 is computer architecture. Um, you guys probably know that 1210 is offered by current taught by Professor Dave Urbanizzi. 2300 myself, I'm using the initial here. Uh, 3140, currently taught by Professor Neil Snap, and for 750, Christina Dilimitro. Right. So, this is the current course pipeline right, for computer engineering. 
Okay, my assumption is that the requirements here is that you need you guys need to just finish this four, four courses over four years, and then you can graduate with a Cornell degree in CE in computer engineering. Okay, um, let me change. Now that this is clear, right? This is my setup. Now that this is clear, um, I'm going to ask you guys a bonus question pretty soon. Let me change the setting a bit. Okay, let's say let's change the scenario a bit. Okay, you know, let's say, okay, uh, actually the university decided that maybe um, it's a good idea for me to cover all these courses, you know, because first I do enjoy teaching, right, and also, you know, I can actually cover some of this, uh, most of the course materials. In this case, okay, again, you know, I'm going to be one who teach all these courses, right? Basically, uh, in year one, I'm going to cover 1210, 10, 10, 1300, and 41, uh, 3140, then 4750. Okay, in this case, um, you know, for you guys, uh, it is still a four year program, right? You come in, and then you finish just uh, four courses over four years, and then you graduate. Okay. It still take four years for you to graduate. And for the school, right? the school only needs to, again, hypothetically, I'm joking here, right? The school only needs to pay one professor, one instructor. Isn't that a win-win situation? Okay, so here's my bonus question. Who's the loser here? Right? Why are we not doing this? Okay, who's the loser here? This is a bonus question. I'm gonna do a countdown. So don't put your answer in the chat window. I'm gonna count down. So I'll just give you guys three seconds and then please uh, raise your hand. All right, three, two, one. Please raise your hand if you have it. Okay, the first one, uh, Stephen. Um, would it be like the students that come in at like a year where you're not teaching like the 1210. So like, like this year, if you're doing 2300 and then freshmen or students who want to take 1210 would have to wait until you're done with uh, 4750. Very good. The next class, right? Uh, Cecilia, you have a similar answer? Can you unmute? Um, since here you also raise hand. Okay, we cannot hear you. Oh, okay. Right, the professor is also overworked. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. Right. <laughs> Thanks for the concern. This is a good point. Okay. Um, do you guys agree? Right, Stephen. Uh, you know, both Stephen and Cynthia raised a good point. But the, really, if you think about the loser, right, is the next class. Does it make sense? Right, for the next, for you guys, if you entered the, the, the system, right, you get enrolled, you guys are good, right? You guys get to graduate in four years. How about the next class? How about the next batch of students? How long do they have to wait? How long? This is where you can put in the chat window. Seven years. <laughs> seven. It's three. Are you sure? How does seven come into the picture here? We have four courses, right? Over four years. Really, you have to wait for an Olympic cycle. Make sense? You guys need to wait for the next class need to wait for four years because they need to wait for me to come back to teach 1210 in year five. Is it clear? Okay. For the current batch, it's gonna take four years, right? For the next batch, they need to wait until year five. All right, so if you understand this one, hopefully you guys uh, appreciate uh, how this uh, right, course pipeline is set up. Right? This is basically the essence of pipelining. You know, we are actually not increasing, we are not improving this uh, term, this metric called latency. Latency means uh, how much time you need to complete 
this degree. You still need four years to complete this degree. But instead, we, with pipelining, we are improving. Right? So what we're doing is like this, right? We assign you know, four instructors, right? four professors to cover these four different courses. Um, this is where we improve this sort of throughput, meaning that we can now take a new class of students every single year instead of every four years. This is how we improve the throughput of the system. Okay, hopefully this is clear. Okay. Now let me uh, add one more twist to this. Okay, so let's say you know all of us, all the professors, uh, you know, really want to know more about the students, right? The incoming students before we start the new offering of a class. So that's where we actually want to get the exams. For example, for me, right, for twenty hundred, I want to get all the exams and homework, right, uh, from twelve ten from a professor Ebenezi before my semester, before my year starts, okay? So that's where professor Ebenezi needs to put all the exams, the student exams and all the homework into a, a locker, okay, this is a locker. And each locker can only hold uh, materials for one class. And this is, uh, in this case, right, same for professor right now, right? Uh, for 3140 and same for 4750. In this case, how many lockers do we need? You can just feel free to put your answer in the chat window. Can we get away with one locker? Now that we are back to the regular course pipeline, right? So basically all the four courses are being offered at the same time. So that's how we improve the throughput. Very good, okay? We need at least three lockers between right, each pair of courses. Make sense? Right. Okay, so if we only, if we roll back, right, we go, we roll back. So if you only have a single instructor, we do this sequentially, we only need one locker, right? But in this case, we actually need three lockers. Right, L1, L2, L3. Okay, so this is basically intuition behind pipelining. If you understand this one, uh, you know, the microprocessor pipeline is actually very much similar. Any questions about this? Come on. Yeah, um, why did you say we would need one locker if it was the same professor for all the classes? Uh, right, so I was just saying that you know, we can, so there, uh, I'm reverting back to this case, right? right. Because only, is it myself is teaching all the classes. So at any given time, only one course is active, right? That's where we can reuse the locker. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I just thought that you would already like know the students so you wouldn't need the oh, locker. Sure. Okay, sure. So, you know, just in case I don't have a good memory, right? I do wanna right, review the materials. Okay, okay. Uh, again, this is a hypothetical, right, uh, scenario. But uh, hopefully this gives you guys uh, a good intuition behind how pipelining works. If you understand this one, then this is how we pipeline the microprocessor. We basically divide this a single cycle microprocessor into five stages. Again, IF means instruction fetch, ID, instruction decode, EX, execute, man, memory operation, WB, write back. Then we have this locker in between. These uh, gray boxes are basically the, the lockers. So this is where uh, we pass the results from the proof stage to the, the next stage. And these are basically the, the so-called pipeline registers. We can just use register, we can just use FIFOS to store these, uh, these intermediate results. Okay, in this case, we have five stages and we have four uh, pipeline registers. We also name these pipeline registers. For the one between IF and ID, we just name it IF slash ID and et cetera, right? Okay, so how is this useful, right? Let's, uh, let's uh, you know, it's useful for the course, course pipeline, but it's also useful for microprocessor. In the single cycle case, hopefully this is now clear why this is called single cycle. 
we basically squeeze right all of those, all these five stages, all the five steps into a single clock cycle. And then we move on to the next one with the pipeline scenario, right? Instead, we divide it into five stages. Now that uh, we have shorter critical paths, right? Between each uh, pair of pipeline register, we can actually run this thing as a higher call frequency. Now let's just uh, assume the ideal scenario. We can just run uh, at a 5x higher clock frequency. So this is what we am doing here. First instruction comes in, right? It takes five clock cycle. When does the second instruction come in, in this case, with the pipeline? Cycle two or cycle six? CC2, right? Very good. Next, CC3, right? Four, cycle four, five, cycle five. Okay. All right, so that's where okay, we first warm up the pipeline, and this is where, right? At a certain point, if you have more instructions come in, uh, at a certain point, we will reach this so-called steady state, where all the five stages are busy. They are all processing some task. Okay. That's how we make full use of the, you know, this uh, all the hardware resources. Okay, so let me ask you guys a question. Um, in this case, we have five instructions, right? Uh, we can finish five instruction with nine cycles. Okay. Um, over here, I'm assuming that this is five milliseconds, right? We have a five milliseconds clock period, right? And this is this two, right? So we suggest uh, two instructions. We need uh, already need ten milliseconds, right? But over here, so we have a shorter clock period each. A cycle just one in a second. So we can actually execute, if you look at this one, we can actually execute five instructions uh, within just nine nanoseconds. Okay. This is obviously faster. Okay, so let me ask you guys a question. What if I have been 100 instructions and I still have the perfect pipeline? I'm able to process one instruction per cycle. How many cycles do I need to finish 100 instructions? with this kind of pipe. I need nine cycles, right? To finish five instructions. Very good. Uh, Y104, Henry four, because we need five cycles to finish the first instruction, right? Then for the, the remaining instructions, right? We will be able to finish one new instruction per cycle. Right, basically, we need five cycles to sort of warm up the pipeline, and then we can graduate one new instruction every single clock cycle. Basically, five plus ninety-nine. Right, look here. We need five clock cycles, right, to finish the first one, and then after that, you get to finish the remaining ninety-nine instructions every single clock cycles. This is number four. Yes, so this is the ideal scenario, right? Alma, you're asking a very good question. There will be additional delay. So this is the, right? Uh, we're gonna talk about those later on. But for now, let's just uh, assume the, the ideal case, right? There will be additional. It's not like we can get one in a second. The, these are different stages may not be balanced anyway, but we will still be able to improve the performance in most cases. All right, um, you know, we just talked about this, right? With 100 instructions, we need uh, 104 clock cycles. If we have a large amount of instructions, let's say we have n instructions, okay? Um, you know, we need this number right? in the ideal pipeline. So when n is large, when n grows to infinity, we get to process right? uh, each instruction just in one clock cycle. There's something called CPI, cycles per instruction. Right? When n is large, you have a perfect pipeline, the CPI, the cycles per instruction, is going to be close to one, right? When n grows to infinity, that's where we get a close to five x speed up right, compared to the single cycle microprocessor case. For a single cycle microprocessor, we need five uh, nanosecond, right? In this case, one nanosecond. That's how we get speed up. Again, it's the ideal case. We are gonna be looking at the harsh reality pretty soon, okay? And there are actually many things to consider. 
uh, we will not get uh, the perfect pipeline all the, all the time. Okay, if this is clear, um, let's look at how we actually 